Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay, and uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to stop in and giving me a little bit of your time on what must be a very fun conference. We only have 15 minutes, and I'm going to try and leave maybe a couple of minutes for questions, so I'll try and just get some thoughts out in the next 10 minutes. And maybe some thoughts different than what probably most sessions will discuss. Uh, I'm sure you'll see a lot of sessions that will discuss super art, great artists, um, interesting collections doing interesting things with their community, and all of these are wonderful, and what the NFT space is all about. But I'd like to focus on something a little bit more conceptual, a little bit more uh, abstract, a little bit more longer term. We are in a world that runs on databases. Uh, your airline, your Uber, the, your polling stations, your banks, your government, social media, Twitter, Facebook, it all runs on a series of gigantic databases. And those databases have been progressively centralizing due to the quote unquote power law effects of the internet uh, in that the internet tends to have runaway winners. So we all use Twitter and we all use Facebook and we all use Google and maybe 15, 20, no more than 100 major services. And this is fine. I mean, these are good, good services. I use them all day long. But they do lead to a privatization, a corporatization of what was previously the public sphere. If you imagine SMTP is the protocol for email, and Twitter is probably the protocol for short messaging online, while well, Twitter, though it thought about becoming a protocol in its early years, ended up becoming a service. And so we end up having very interesting or contentious, quote unquote, cultural wars about who was allowed to tweet. And apparently the governance of who was allowed to, the, the way we decide who's allowed to tweet is dependent on who the CEO of Twitter is from time to time. Whereas you might have noticed that we don't have these discussions about email. Uh, there's no CEO of email. There is nobody who has to decide for every single person on the planet if each one of their emails are appropriate, inappropriate, harmful, not harmful, and so on. Because it's an impossible job, including an impossible job for Twitter. Uh, there's no person in the world that could read everyone's emails and conclude if they're correct, if they're not correct. It's not a job for a human. It's not a job for a team. It's not even a job for an AI. There's too many opinions in the world that differ for someone to make that judgment. We are heading into a world that will become more digital, not less digital. More digitally immersive, not less digitally immersive. When people speak about the metaverse, there are as many definitions of the metaverse as people who speak about the metaverse, but I'll share with you mine. My view is the metaverse is just the internet, but with better visualization and persistent digital objects. If you've been on the internet for a while, like I have, we've seen the visualization get better and better. Uh, we now can do Zooms and have global, real-time, free video conferencing. We didn't used to have that previously. Uh, today, it looks quite good on a two-dimensional 20-inch screen, but even that in the future is going to look like a bug, not a feature. The long-term visualization layer of the internet is going to be in five or 10 or 15 years something like a pair of sunglasses that are augmented mixed reality sunglasses. Mostly you will see the world around you with a digital layer around it. Once in a while you'll go to virtual reality, but it will be mostly, I believe, augmented reality. 
and in time the screen will fade away as the main user experience. And in that world, digital objects will become more important. Now what are persistent digital objects? Well, an avatar is a persistent digital object. I'm famously identified with my profile picture. Um, they will become 3D avatars. Digital art, uh, fidenzas, ringers, um, anti-cyclones, all these beautiful generative art. It, you'll want to display them in digital spaces. Virtual spaces themselves, workspaces, personal spaces, family spaces. All of these are going to become progressively more important as the visualization layer gets better. And for me, the important thing about NFTs, the important thing about where we stand today, isn't if a certain NFT is more beautiful or less beautiful, underpriced, overpriced, or the correct price, who even knows about these things. But the important thing about NFTs is they have provided us an alternative technical architecture by which we can organize the metaverse. The default technical architecture, the architecture if we don't do anything, if the concepts of an open metaverse do not win, is going to be that most likely a handful of technology companies in the Western world, most likely American technology companies, not European, Facebook, Google, Apple, Epic, companies like this, will be the reference databases for your digital objects. They will have your avatar, they will have your art, they will have your work papers, like you do now. And what that means is everything about your interaction with friends, family, colleagues, will effectively move from the public sphere where it is now in the physical world, to the private sphere, and specifically, most likely, to an American corporate private sphere. And so you will be interacting with people through the terms of service of Twitter or Facebook. You will legally speaking be on their servers. Uh, you will legally speaking not have the right to be there except if they let you. I think this is the wrong way to architect the internet. I think this is the wrong way to architect our digital future. I think this is the wrong way to architect the metaverse. Just like in real physical reality, we have public spheres that are not corporatized. Parks, lakes, roads, your home, all of these are things where you can move freely, you can make decisions on your own behalf, you can be quote unquote self-custodial. I mean, it's a very funny concept how this has all been turned around. In physical art, it is completely uncontroversial to say you can own a Renoir self-custodially, aka in your own house, aka you don't have to have I don't know, Societe Generale, hold it for you. You can own it yourself. And yet in the United States and in the European Union, there is a constant debate of if you should be able to hold tokens self-custodial or if some large organization, which is going to be a large company, should hold them for you. If would you should be allowed to own a piece of digital art yourself or to somebody to hold it for you. I think it is crucially important that the next generation of the internet reclaims a public, interoperable, global space where individuals and organizations, but really to me, my interest is individuals, can hold things directly. Now, does this mean large companies won't build interesting applications? Of course they can. Nothing is preventing Facebook from making a metaverse or Epic from making a game and that game can be private and be corporate. But for example, it will interact with my profile picture by interacting with my Ethereum wallet. 
It will not own my profile picture. I will not be a guest on their servers for my identity. I will control my own identity. And then they can decide to enable my identity in their game. And that's fine. And when I'm in their game, they will read my identity from my wallet and I'll play by their rules in their game. But then I can walk out and control my identity in a different context. I have been in the cryptocurrency field for a long time, about a decade. And my view is the most likely way we can succeed in having this public, decentralized, non-corporate spaces is actually through NFTs, not through fungible tokens. And the reason is, NFTs are comprehensible to regular people. People can understand, hey, that's my profile picture in a way that this is my profile picture on LinkedIn. People can understand this is my sword in a game. People can understand this is a photograph from a great photographer that I've bought and I want to own. And it's very strange if a company or the state says, I can't own a photograph if it happens to be digitally. So I think we're in this very unusual and exciting time where art might actually pull enough people into a uh, decentralized public commons and lead to a much freer, uh, much more innovative, but most importantly, much freer next generation of the internet. So I will stop there to at least leave a couple of minutes for questions. Hi. Um, can you tell us more about the um, digital charter, right, or digital rights charter initiative, where it stands right now? Yes. So we have been working um, for the last few months of putting out a document, and it's a document for discussion. It will be a version one, and then I'm sure there will be a version two, three, four, and five uh, that we call the digital rights charter, and. The concept behind the Digital Rights Charter is that for those people who live in okay. constitutional democracies and are used to the types of rights um, that constitutional democracies offer their citizens, that the basis of a constitutional democracy is that there is a balance of power between the state and the citizen, um, that those rights should exist in a very similar form in the digital sphere. If it is normal that you can own private property in the physical sphere, it should be normal that you can own private property in the digital sphere. If it is normal that you can have an expectation of privacy in your own home, it should be normal that you can have an expectation of privacy when you're speaking to your family online, and so on and so forth. We hope in the next few weeks, probably sometime in March, we will make public a first version of it. And we don't expect that the next day some country is going to adopt it, but I do think it will serve as a starting point for discussion because most of the discussion around cryptocurrencies has been on topics that I consider broadly unimportant in a way, right? Like, is it is, uh, is the price going to go up? Is it going to replace the euro? All these things. None of these things are the relevant parts, right? But the relevant parts are how do we structure a constitutional democracy in a world that is going to be overwhelmingly digital? And I think one thing that happens, people don't quite believe the digital world is real because they look around, they're in the physical world. But most knowledge workers are spending 8, 10, 12 hours looking at a screen, right? The things coming through your screen are all digitally intermediated. On the trend we're going, basically all of our waking hours are going to be digitally intermediated. And so we should have the types of rights we expect in the physical world. They should not go away just because you're looking at a computer screen.
Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your time and see some wonderful art. And uh, please, uh, please help people think about these areas of decentralization.